And it's neat how like-minded individuals try to find each other. Amen. And it's so great that we're all like-minded. And if you're not, there's the door. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it, it, just listen a little while. Maybe you will be. No, I'm just kidding. But I just try to stick with the book. And it's a blessing to find other people that love the King James Bible, love the blood of Jesus, and love salvation and want to be with other people. So this week, we're going to look at this. I want to get to the book of Daniel verse by verse. But with so much going on, I just haven't had a, a chance to get started on that. And so I'm doing, I guess you could call the, these fillers. <laughs> these are filler sermons that I'm just doing until I can get to that point to where we can start on uh, Daniel. But this is something that I was thinking about this week that I can't believe I've never preached this yet. And I went back and looked and I, I've never, this is one of the most basic doctrines in the whole Bible. And probably one of the sermons that is preached the most by a lot of churches, at least Bible-believing churches. And I can't believe I haven't talked about it. So we're going to look at this today. and You've probably heard this before, but there's nothing wrong with hearing it again. Amen. Yeah. And this is probably going to be one of the best things that new converts can get a hold of. Because this is who we are, where we came from, what we're for. And this is talking about. And I didn't know how to talk about this or how to title it, so I'm sure they're going to twist your words anyway, so it doesn't matter. But I thought of calling this trifold salvation, but I just went with threefold salvation. What does that mean, threefold salvation? And we're going to look at that today because when we're saved, God saves us, but our body's not saved yet, is it? No. That's a daily struggle with this stupid sinful flesh to no. fight the flesh. The flesh isn't saved until the rapture. And then is the Spirit saved? Well, we get the Holy Spirit in us, but we're not going to be free from sin until we're in heaven. Amen. And I think about that a lot, how great it'll be to be in a place where there is no sin. Because there's too much of it everywhere I look down here. And it hurts others and sin hurts yourself. So imagine being in a place where nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Won't that be wonderful? And nobody can sin. So we're going to look at this today. Let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And like I said, you probably already know this. This might not be new to some of you. But sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Like the Bible says, a word fitly, uh, uh, yeah, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. So this is the way that a lot of people preach this, and it's just the best way to say it. And so that's what I want to do is I want to get to this where I just say, you're safe, this, 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 the three parts of, of this. So let's get into it so that you'll see what I'm talking about. Again, I've never taught on this, and I just can't believe that I haven't. It's one of the simplest Bible doctrines, and it's so important for those who are saved that they should understand this and then share this with others, okay? Because this will help clear up confusion. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. All right? Sanctify means clean. Do you like being wholly clean? Holy means all of you. Or do you, when you go take a shower, you just go, okay, wash my arm, I'm good, and walk away? When we get a shower, we want the whole thing clean, right? Um, we don't just want, oh, I'm taking half a shower today and half a shower tomorrow. I'll wash half today. No, you want the whole thing clean. So it says here, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible here tells us that we have three parts. We consist of three. And those three parts are, now we always say it this way. We always say body, soul, and spirit. And that's always how we refer to it. But is that what it says right there? It says it backwards. It says spirit, soul, and body. Isn't that odd? You know why? God wrote the Bible. And what he sees first is the spirit. And then he sees the rest of us. Because he's in a different world. What do I see? I see your body. So I say body, soul, and spirit because I'm looking. So I'm going to say it like we say it, but it's just interesting. It shows you God wrote the Bible. So we consist of a body and a soul and a spirit. And that's who we are. We're tripart beings. So we are consisting of three, but yet we're one. So three and one. Now, what is that? Well, let's look at God. And, you know, the Bible says, let us make man in our image. So God made man, made Adam like himself. And in 1 John 5, 7, only in the King James Bible, by the way, a lot of this is taken out in new versions. But it tells us who God is. 
And 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word. Notice that's a capital W. That's always referring to Jesus when it's a capital W. When it's a lowercase, it's talking about the Bible. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are three. Is that what it says? No. <laughs> no there's not three different gods. It says these three are one. So those three are one. So we have the Father. Now, who would he correspond with? Well, the Father would be kind of the soul, right? And the Son, well, the Son is the body because Jesus came in flesh. So the Son would be Jesus. And then the Spirit, well, that would be the Holy Ghost. So God is one God in three persons. There's no problem saying persons because he can exist in three persons but still be one. But we could say he also has three parts, like we're three parts. So God created Adam in his image, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Three in one. So God is three in one. We call this the Godhead in the Bible, or we use the term Trinity. There's no problem with that because we know what we're talking about. All right, we're not talking about three different gods. We're talking about one God in three. So as God is a triune being or a Trinity, he made Adam in his image, and Adam is a triune being, and so are we triune beings. We are three in one. So God created man in his image. Are we still in God's image today? You say yes, you say no. Uh-oh, which one is it? Let's go to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 5 and let me show you. Because in a way, we're still three, but there's something that we have that's missing because of the sin of Adam and Eve. So are we in this, when we're born, do we pop out the same way that Adam was created. Adam, I believe, probably had a glow about him when he was created. And he probably was glowing because when God makes something, he makes it perfect. Right? Yeah. And he was innocent until what happened? He fell into sin. And when he fell, he lost something. And when he lost something, the Bible is very clear that we are not made in God's image. It says we're in Adam's image. So look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. Oh, wait, I said 5, I meant 3, excuse me. Uh, Genesis 5, 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness. Well, what is that? After his image and called his name Seth. So something changed. God made Adam and Eve perfect. And he made them all three, three in one. But something happened because when Adam had a kid, he said, now that was in his image, not in God's image. So what happened? Well, we'll turn over to Romans chapter 5, and I think you know what happened. Somebody came along and deceived Eve, and uh, Adam ate as well, and they fell into sin. And because of that, something died. Something died. Romans chapter 5, because God can't have anything to do with sin. God hates sin. So Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore... As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. If we were created in God's image, we wouldn't die. Because when God made Adam and Eve, He made them so they'd never die. But they sinned. And now because of sin, we die. So we receive the naturaleza, I'm trying to think of that word in English, the nature, the sin nature, Sometimes my mind thinks in Spanish, but this, does that happen to you in German sometimes? Yeah. So the sin nature is on all of us when we're born because we're born in Adam's image. Does that make sense to you? So there's something that took place. What is it? All right. So here we are. We're a body, soul and spirit. Well, when Adam sinned, the Holy Spirit left because the Holy Spirit's like, I can't be in sin. I can't be around sin. So. He died spiritually. Remember God told him, the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Well, Adam and Eve sinned, and they didn't die. Or did they? Well, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years one day. How old was Adam when he died? 900 and, I always forget, 900 and, was it 69 or something? I forget how, 900 and, however old he was, he wasn't quite a thousand years. So, naturally, he died within a thousand years. But spiritually, that same day that he sinned, he died. So the day that he sinned, he died. So the Spirit of God left him. So now he's what? He's two-thirds of a man. He's a body, he's a soul, and he's a dead spirit, not a live spirit. And when you're two-thirds, what you know what that is in fractional form? That's 0.666. Isn't that an awful number? 
But you turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and it's talking about the, the beast, the mark of the beast. It says that the number of the beast, which is the number of a man, is 666. So we are all two-thirds whole. We're not whole when we're born into this world. We're born into this world, and we're born with a live body, and we're born with a live soul, but we're born with a dead spirit. And that's why we're in the image of Adam. And do you all understand that? So I don't know how to explain exactly what that is, but the best way that they've ever said to explain what we are is either a basketball or a football or a soccer ball, whichever is easier for you, whatever sport you like, right? But let's take a football. You have a football and it's got a pig skin around it. That football also has a rubber bladder inside of that. And then inside of that is air. Now, if you take that football and you take that pig skin off and all you have is a rubber bladder full of air, can you play football? It would be very hard because that, that uh, skin is there for the grip on it to make that spiral. So it's not going to work unless all three are there. Let's say you take a football and you say, well, I don't need a rubber bladder in there. I'll take that thing out and then you put it back together and you pump it up with air and it goes Psh, and it all comes out because that skin's not enough to hold the air. It needs that little bladder in there. Well, let's say you want to play football, but there's no air in it. Are you going to go play football, are you? So you have to have all three. So the body is like that skin. The soul is like the, the bladder inside. And then a spirit is like this empty area that can be filled. So it's like the inside of that ball, and that ball has to be filled. Otherwise, that ball's no good. So when you're born into this world, you're born with a live body, a live soul, but a dead spirit. And that spirit is just sitting there waiting for something to come into it. And if you're not saved, a demon could come inside there, or a devil, and inhabit. A matter of fact, a thousand of them, at least, could come into somebody. And usually that's because someone begins dabbling in the spirit world and communicating with those things and doing evil, evil stuff. But you also can have the Holy Spirit come and live in there, just like Adam and Eve were before they fell. So this is what the Bible talks about, and this is the doctrine of being born again. And when we talk about being born again, that's being born again spiritually. Okay. Now, I could do a message on born again. Um, the nation of Israel is born again. Um, our body is born again at the rapture. It's a resurrection. So there's different born agains. When I'm talking about born again, though, I'm talking about born again spiritually. And there's a spiritual new birth that takes place when you get saved. Did you know that? And that new birth is essential. Let's go to John chapter 3. And this is important to understand. All right. Now, I know some people are going to go, no, 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 and they're the hyper-dispensationalists. No, there's no born again for today. Well, when I show you in Paul, you're going to go, oh, <laughs> because yes, born again is a doctrine for us today, and it's a spiritual birth, and we are born again today spiritually when we get saved. So Jesus says this in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Now that's gross, ain't it? I don't want to think about that. But that shows you he's only thinking of the physical. He's not thinking spiritually. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now what does it mean, born of the water? Some people try to say, Well, that means you've got to get baptized. No. The first time you're born, you come out of a sack of water. What does your wife say? My water broke. All right, to go have the baby. So that's the water. So the first birth is the water birth. The second birth is a spiritual birth. That which is born of the flesh, oh, 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 skip down there, excuse me. Um, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. So you must be born again is what the Bible says. Matter of fact, verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So there is a spiritual birth that takes place. Now let's go look at Paul real quick in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29. And that's what takes place at salvation. The Spirit of God comes inside you. And that's the rebirth of your spirit. So Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29. 
In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29, Paul teaches this as well. So this is not just Jesus teaching being born again. This is Paul teaching a spiritual birth that must take place. And Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29 says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So there are lost people that aren't born again, that have been born once, that persecute us who've been born again. The old uh, pastor reminds you say it like this, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. What does that mean? If you're born one time, well then you're going to die, and then you're going to die again after the, the judgment. But if you're saved, then you get born again. Now you've been born twice. Now you only die one time. Because when you die, you go to heaven, and then you get your resurrected body. So does that make sense to you? Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. And how do we get born again? Now, when you talk about born again, it's very important that, that you understand what I'm saying. And I'm sure you do. But there's other people that take Bible words and they make it mean what they want it to mean. I remember talking to this woman one time and I asked her, hey, are you born again? And she goes, yes, of course I'm born again. We talked for a while. And it turns out she's a Roman Catholic. She's just as lost as a goose. And so I finally went, when I say born again, what does that mean to you? She goes, when I was baptized as a child in water. <laughs> to her, that's what born again meant. I go, well, that's not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, have you ever trusted the gospel? So you see, when you talk to somebody, always make them explain their terms because they might be thinking something completely different Amen. and be using that word to define that as something else to them. You know what I'm saying? That's how arguments get started. <laughs> Let's all be on the same page. Paul says this. So make sure you, you hear what I'm saying. A born again experience. That means when you get saved, you're born again. That's being begotten. Would you agree? When you're born, you're begotten. All right. So Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the what? The gospel. So the preaching of the gospel leads to salvation. And when you preach the gospel and someone gets saved, what takes place? A spiritual birth. That dead spirit now becomes alive. And who goes inside there? The Holy Spirit. And so that's the new birth. And when you're saved, now the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And when you yield to the Spirit, it can guide and lead you into all righteousness. Now, you know the gospel. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. And it's all about how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and then He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And it's all about the blood, because it says how that Christ died. Let's turn over to Romans 3.25. And I preach this message every time I can, because this is how you're saved. It's through the blood. By the way, when you're born, did you know when you come out, there's some blood there? Your mother, and I don't want to get graphic, but it tears some stuff, and... Sometimes worse than others. I learned a new word, episiotomy. I don't, I don't like that word, but there's things there that if you're a woman, you know about this. If you're a man, forget about it. <laughs> you know, there's some things we don't need to know. Thank God men don't give birth. Amen. Are we? Oh, anyway. But um, be there for your wife. I still, my arm has a perpetual bruise from when my wife had her first baby and she squeezed my arm so hard. To this day, it's still bruised. No, I'm just kidding. But I don't know how women do it. I don't know how women do it. But I'll tell you something, and it might be a little weird, but my dad recorded my birth and my sister's birth on an old 30 millimeter camera. And I remember as a kid, dad showing me when I was born. No one should ever see that. You know what I'm saying? That's just, but all I can remember is coming out and crying. I had a little bit of blood here, a little bit of blood here, a little bit of blood here. So the first time I was born, I was covered in blood. I thought that was so strange. But when we're saved, how are we saved? By the blood. And when we're born again, we're covered in the blood. Amen. So why do you leave out the blood? You can't leave it out in the first birth. <laughs> now, Laura, when we had one of our babies, it was a little different. We had, a, in a, um, we had a water birth. So we were in a big tub and we had that baby. And so I guess the water washed a lot of that away or whatever. But still, there was some blood involved. And I actually got in the tub with her. It was a big heated tub. And at first I was like, this is going to be gross. But I'm like, no, no, this isn't gross. And I was there and I was watched the baby come out. And it was just, it's fascinating how God makes the human body to do certain things. 
And when Emma came out, she came out from underwater, came up, just looked around, never cried. <laughs> and so if you're going to have a baby, may you consider a water birth? Because Laura will tell you, so less um, like stress and, and worry and you're already relaxed a little bit. And it's just nice to, in a relaxed atmosphere, do that. Amen. And uh, when it comes to salvation, there should be in a relaxed atmosphere to just sit down and talk to someone and, and share the gospel with them. It's always better than just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of women today have a drug induced birth and that's stressful. And, and that can lead to, what is it called? Postpartum, postpartum, things like that. So I'm not going to get into this. I'm not to make this about midwife or wifery. Although you can go back and look at one of our live streams because Laura's one of her best friends is a midwife. And we did a video about that. And I believe in midwives, to be honest with you. I think that's the best care and everything. So where, where am I going with all this? Um, oh, Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the mission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So faith in His blood, why is blood so important? There's no life without blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, it says in Leviticus 17, 11. So in order to have physical life, there's got to be blood. So why would it be any different when you're born again? There's got to be blood. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to trust in that precious blood of Jesus because that's where forgiveness is. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The Old Testament, God wanted forgiveness. He brought a sacrifice. He knew when that blood was offered, that was, that was it. He was forgiven. Well, today it's the blood of Jesus. Thank God that we don't bring the sacrifice. He made the sacrifice. We come to Jesus. We receive the atonement. Now we're forgiven of our sins. So see how it all ties together? The first birth is a type of the second birth. But the first birth is into the wrong world, <laughs> if you will. We, there's two different worlds. There's the physical world and there's the spiritual world. And we right now are in both. Did you know that? We are in two different worlds at one time. How? Well, all I can see of you is your body, and your body is in this world, the physical world. I can't see your soul, and I can't see your spirit. But your soul is in this world too, but your soul is a spiritual thing. It's also in this world. So you're in both worlds at once. And then when you're born, this is dead. When you're saved, this comes alive, and guess who comes inside of you? The Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit has access to this world to guide you in your body to do something for Him. You see how that works? So will you yield to do something for him? But when you die, this body, this soul goes into the spirit world to either heaven or hell. And that's what the Bible teaches. And so that's why we go around and tell people the gospel. We want to get them saved so they go to heaven when they die. We don't want to see people go to hell. I don't even want to see my worst enemy go to hell because hell is for all eternity. And I don't want to see anybody suffer for all eternity. Now, maybe a million years, a couple million years, I might... But that's in the flesh, isn't it? That's, but imagine someone suffering forever. I wouldn't want that for my worst enemy. I want to see people get saved and go to heaven. Amen. So what I'm doing today is I'm trying to show you trifold salvation. Now, this is really important, and I'm trying to figure out where's the best place to, to put this up here. It's all right if I erase this real quick, because here's what I want you to see when it comes to salvation, the trifold or threefold part of salvation. We're saved you could say it like this. I am saved. I'm being saved. I shall be saved. What? What do you mean by that? Well, each one of those three parts is something taking place at a different time. I'm saved. What is saved? My soul is saved. So when I'm saved, this is whenever I got saved, I'm saved. This would be my soul from the penalty of sin. Okay, do you understand that? So when I'm saved, this again in my soul, when I'm saved, when I'm saying I'm saved, what am I saying? I'm saying Jesus saved my soul. And he saved my soul from the penalty of sin, which means I can't go to hell. Because my soul has been saved by Jesus Christ. Again, has my body yet? Not yet. But my soul. Now let's look at Romans 5.9. Romans 5, 9 says, much more than being now justified by his blood, going back to the blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What is wrath? That's hell. God's wrath upon sin. 
And when Jesus died on the cross for sin, he died for all sins. And when we're saved, he forgives us of all our sins, past, present, and future. Go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. Colossians 2, 13. So he didn't just die for all the sins that we do up to a point, and then after we sin again, oh boy, he's got to die on the cross all over again, right? Wow, it'd never end, would it? That one sacrifice for sins forever that Jesus did paid for all my sins, past, present, and future. So Colossians 2.13 says, And you being dead in your sins. What does that mean? That means your dead spirit. Your spirit's dead. You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened. Quickened means brought to light together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Isn't that a beautiful verse? That means all my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. The ones that I haven't even thought of doing yet are still under the blood. Now, is that an excuse to go do more? Nope. No, we don't look at that as excuse, and I'll get to that here in a minute. But what does the Bible say in Revelation 1.5? It says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So when we get saved, it's the soul that's saved, and that soul is washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That means this soul now belongs to Jesus, and it's going to heaven. Right? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Amen. Now, some people say, well, you get saved and you can lose it. Um, it's just like being born. Well, guess what? I just got unborn on accident. I'm not here. I'm invisible all of a sudden. Once you're born, you're always born. You can't get unborn. And even Nicodemus figured that out when he asked Jesus that. So once you're born again, how do you get unborn again? You tell me you got to get born again again? How does that work? There's no getting born again 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 again. So I'm on my 15th birth right now, brother. I mean, there's no losing it and getting back. It's a one-time thing. You're born again. Now, the question is, are you going to be a good son or a bad son? You're still a son, but are you going to be a son that obeys? Or are you going to be a disobedient son? You see that? Uh, some of you have had kids in here. You, maybe you like one of the kids more than the other <laughs> because one of them's more awful than the rest of them. I don't know. I hope you don't play favorites because that doesn't always work well. But according to the Bible, salvation is being born again and God saves your soul. And then guess what? Now it belongs to him. Let me show you that. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. So it's good to be born again and it's good to be saved. How do we get saved? Again, this verse says it's through the gospel. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit comes inside of us when we get saved. But look at verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What is the purchased possession? The blood of Jesus Christ purchased your soul. Amen. When you trust Him, your soul is no longer yours. Now it's His. Is He going to take His soul and put it in hell? Especially when the Holy Spirit's in there. Is He going to take the Holy Spirit and go, well, the guy's sinned, so Holy Spirit, go to hell with him. Because it says it's sealed. <laughs> People say, well, it leaves. Well, if it leaves, then it wasn't sealed, was it? So, according to the Bible, when we're saved, we're saved from the penalty of sin in the sense that our soul is saved and our soul cannot go to hell. Now, that is not an excuse to go sin, but that is what salvation is. Salvation is the purchased price of our soul. You ever heard of someone selling their soul to the devil? Well, that's the opposite. When we're saved, we trust Jesus. Now, He's purchased our soul. Now, it belongs to Him. And it's going to heaven when it dies. When the body dies. Only question is, will it have any rewards up there? Because if you lived a sinful life as a Christian, you don't have any rewards in heaven. But if you do something for Jesus, you do. So do you understand that? So that's past. When you got saved, you were saved from the penalty of sin. That's your soul. Now here's the present. And here's your body. Okay? And your body is saved from the power of sin. Okay? Saved from the power of of sin. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean when I get saved, I never sin again? Unfortunately, no. But with the Holy Spirit in me, I don't have to sin Amen. because the Holy Spirit is more powerful. And if I yield to the Spirit and that power, then I can walk in the Spirit 
so I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. So there is power in the blood and there's power in the spirit. And so I want to do what Jesus said. So give me some time here for these verses. There's a bunch of them, but I want you to see this because this is what we have to go through in our daily life. We are in a saved soul if we're saved, but we're still stuck in a body of sin. We are our own worst enemy. We are closer to our worst enemy than we because I'm inside my own worst enemy. I'm in a prison of flesh that wants to sin, and yet I'm inside and I'm sinless in God's eyes. My soul's saved, but I'm stuck in, stuck in this. <laughs> I have to look at this in the mirror every day. And I have to live with this when I do something stupid. Isn't that horrible? But is that my soul that sins? No, that's the flesh. So what I need to do is every day get down on my knees and say, Lord, help me to fight the flesh and to do right because my soul's saved, but my body isn't yet. So I'm yielding to you to help me stay away from sin. And some Christians get a hold of that and do well. Other Christians just came, seem to fall and fall and fall and fall, don't they? But look what it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as the instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, sounds like God's saying, hey, uh, yield to the Spirit, where the power is, and don't yield to the flesh. Unfortunately, some Christians are just fleshly. And they'd rather do what the body wants than what the Holy Spirit wants. Now, they're saved. They're just carnal. That's called a carnal Christian. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 19, one of my favorite verses. What does it say? 2 Timothy 2, 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. The Lord knows who's born again and who's not. And if you're born again, then your soul is saved and it belongs to Jesus. But it says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God doesn't want you as a saved person to live in sin. And he can help you with that because sin is powerful. Sin is addictive, isn't it? But he gives you power to break that addiction. <laughs> Amen. So you don't have to give in to that addiction. You can say, no, I can do right and get out of this. Jesus didn't save us to sin. He saved us to serve. So go to Galatians chapter 5. And part of the Christian life is a fight. It really is. And if I had to fight it on my own, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I could do it. Because I don't think I'm powerful enough. But if I have God in me who's willing to help me overcome and get through it and get the victory, then I'm going to just trust in Him and say, help me, Lord, get the victory over this sin. Only thing is, a lot of Christians don't want the victory over sin sometimes, do they? They like the easy way. What do the Germans say? There must be a harder way to do it or something. Um, a lot of people want to follow the easy way. Well, sometimes it's hard to do right, isn't it? But if you're yielding to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps you and makes it easier. Amen. What greater friend could you ask for than God? And He lives inside you when you're saved. Amen. Do you realize every time you sin, the Holy Spirit's in you going, oh. That's why the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Have you ever sinned as a Christian? And you just felt, oh, all of a sudden, that's the Holy Spirit. And you're going, hey, dummy, <laughs> what'd you do that for? <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's why it, it's not fun to sin as a Christian. I say it like this. A Christian can't enjoy sin. Lost people are like dogs. <laughs> they go do whatever and <laughs> they enjoy it. They don't feel bad about it or nothing. But when you're saved and you go do something that's a sin, you just feel like, oh, I'm the worst person in the world. You feel horrible. And it grieves the Holy Spirit in you. So, I don't know if you're saved or not, but if you could go sin and not feel bad about it, check and make sure if you really got saved. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because there's power inside of us when we're saved that says, hey, bro, don't do that. You know what I'm saying? So, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to serve one another. So we're not saved to sin, we're saved to serve. And now look at verse um, 16 and 17. 
This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. See that capital S? That's the Holy Spirit in you if you're saved. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Sometimes there's a real battle that goes on in our life, and a lot of times our flesh gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And we need the Spirit to be stronger. So one preacher said it's like two dogs. And whichever dog you feed the most is going to be the stronger dog that's going to whip the other dog, right? So do I feed the flesh more? Well, then my flesh is going to be a little bit more powerful. Or do I walk in the Spirit and I read my Bible and I study and I come to church and I do all the things? And then that gets more powerful. Now it's easier for me to not do what the flesh wants. So you see what I need to feed? I need to feed the Spirit and not feed the flesh. Otherwise, I'm going to be beating myself up. And a lot of times, a lot of Christians do that, and they're just walking around doing things they shouldn't do, and they beat themselves up. And it's a shame. What does 1 Corinthians 15, 34 say? And so, are you reading your Bible? Are you studying? Are you doing what you should? Or are you just going around like a bump on a log, like my dad used to say, and just doing all the things the world does, and, oh, I haven't read my Bible in two months. I forget. Well, which one do you think is going to be more powerful? Which one are you going to be walking in, the flesh or in the spirit? 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, awake to righteousness. Notice it doesn't say get woke. It says awake. I mean, that's a little different. Uh, the woke seem to go against the Bible. The awake are the ones that follow the Bible. But awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So it's a shame to sin. I had an old preacher one time years ago that told me, he said, Brother Breaker, you ought to rather want to die than sin against the holy God. And boy, I thought about that. He said, you know what Jesus would rather do? Jesus would rather die than sin. Amen. He said, he'd rather die than to see you sin. So he died for your sins. How much do you love God? Do you love him enough that you feel so bad about sin that you'd rather die than sin against him? If that's your attitude, you'd do a lot less sinning, wouldn't you? Because you don't want to hurt him. Do you know it hurts him when you sin? And so as a, as a saved person, my soul's saved. I can go do stuff in the flesh if I want to, but my body is saved from the power in the sense that I don't have to do what the body says. I can come over here and do what he wants. And the more I live for him, the more power I get, and the easier it is to put down the flesh. But you got to want it. You, want, you got to want to put aside all those, um, what do they call them, besetting sins like the Bible says. You got to want to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to quit doing that. I'm not going to go watch this or do. You've got to want it. But the spirit is there and it's powerful. Let me show you real quick. I don't want to go too long today, but we're on a roll. So let's go here. Amen. Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven. Here's Paul. And Paul is confessing to us that he doesn't do the best that he can. But at least he's trying. And that's what you need to do as a Christian. At least you need to try. If you fall off a horse, do you just go over and shoot the horse? You get back on it. <laughs> so it, a lot of times as Christians, we fall off the horse. Well, what are we supposed to do? Get back on it. And we need to get on that horse and keep riding the horse. We need to get on the Spirit and, and do what the Holy Spirit wants. Romans chapter 7, verse 18, all the way down to verse 25. Paul the Apostle says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. You ever feel like that sometimes? Man, I want to do right, but I keep messing up. Well, that's what Paul went through. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So it's the flesh that's doing it. It's not the soul that's doing it. The soul belongs to God. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law. It's a war. We call this the Christian warfare. And you need to declare war on your flesh and say, no, I'm not going to let you lust. I'm not going to let you follow sin. I'm going to keep you and I, I'm going to be, well, in the old days, there was chivalry. You know what chivalry is? Where a man would look at himself and say, I want to be honorable because the only thing that matters is my honor. And by that is, I'm going to do right and I'm going to fight evil and not do wrong. And that was an honorable person. 
And you would look at somebody as, man, look at that guy. He's a gentleman. Look at the honor that he has. Because, And I hate to use this word, but this is how they would say because he prides himself on doing good. Well, prides a sin, so it's not really the right way to say it. But you've heard people say that. So-and-so prides himself on doing right. Well, it's not that I'm prideful. It's I want to do right to show that I'm an honorable person that you can trust. Amen. Well, do you want to do right to show God that he can trust you and can use you? God wants to use a clean vessel. You go over to the dishwasher and you open it up and it's not clean. Do you pick up the glass and use it anyway? You don't want to use a vessel that's dirty. God doesn't want to use a dirty vessel. He wants you to be clean. All right. So it says warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? A lot of self-esteem there, huh? <laughs> you know what self-esteem is? Feel good about yourself because you're a good person. What does the Bible say? You're a sinner. There's none good. No, not one. You're a wretched man. <laughs> so I don't teach self-esteem like Joel Osteen, right? Uh, you're good and God loves you. Just keep doing good. You're a good person. No, that's not. The Bible says, man, I try to do right and I keep messing up, but I want to do right. So I'm declaring war on the flesh and I'm going to walk in the spirit. Amen. And then it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh, the law of sin. So we're still sinners after we're saved, unfortunately. But we have power to help us fight the flesh. Amen. And you've got to want that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, excuse me, chapter 12 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4. Powerful verse. Hebrews 12, 4 says, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So as a Christian, we're supposed to strive against sin. We're not striving to sin. We're striving to go out of our way to tap that power of the Holy Spirit and say, help me get the victory over this sin and not do right. Okay? Does that make sense to you? Now, let's look at the last one. Um, well, no, I do have one more verse. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Uh, these are verses that you should memorize because a lot of Christians struggle with sin. And I understand that. And again, sometimes it's an addiction or something like that. But, you know, if you start memorizing these verses and getting them in your heart, it becomes easier to fight the flesh. Amen. You start quoting scriptures to yourself, <laughs> saying, hey, wretched man, Jesus said, right, right. And you quote scripture to yourself and it gets harder to sin. The problem is it's too easy to sin. And the problem is because you let it be. Right? That's right? Hey, not fun message, but the problem is with you, isn't it? It's not God's fault you're sinning, is it? It's your fault. Amen. So why are you doing that? Uh, I won't tell you what my grandpa would have said. Well, he would have gone, hey, stupid, what are you doing? Okay, that, that's what my grandpa would have said. So, but anyway, Romans chapter 6 and verse 18 and 19. Look at what it says here. Romans 6, 18 and 19. Being then made free from sin. My soul is free from sin because it's been purchased and forgiven and washed in the blood. Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the firmity in, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness, un, I always have a, word, a problem with that word, uncleanness. I always want to say uncleanliness, uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so, now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So. Before you were saved, do you remember how you just go do stupid things? A lot of times you'd be like, why did I do that? What was I thinking? You still probably remember stuff and go, that was dumb. Why did I do that? Because you were a servant to sin. But now you're supposed to be a servant unto holiness and just go around and do stuff that's right. And you never go, why did I do that? That was dumb. <laughs> you say, man, I'm glad I did that. That was a blessing. You sleep better at night when you do right than if you do wrong. So it's all about serving and being a servant and wanting to do right. So the last one here is saved. This is the spirit, I guess you could say. Saved from the presence of sin. The presence of sin. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Did I spell that right? The presence of sin. When we die, our body goes down here to the grave. Our soul and our spirit go up here to heaven. Amen. And in heaven, there's no sin. That's why God can't let a sinner into heaven. Otherwise, it'd be no longer be heaven, right? 
And when I'm in heaven, I'm in the spirit world, and there's no sin up there. And that will be wonderful, won't it? Amen. To get to a place where I can't sin anymore. I can't keep kicking myself and saying I'm such an idiot because I keep doing stupid things because I won't ever be able to do another stupid thing. I'll never even be able to think a bad thought. Amen. And that's, so do you see how my body's not saved yet? That's a daily struggle. But when does my body get saved? It's called the day of redemption. Now, my soul has been redeemed by the Bible says, when we have redemption through his blood, that's the soul. But the body, I'm waiting for the day of redemption, which is the rapture. So if I'm dead and in the grave, I come back at the rapture and my body's resurrected and I get a glorified body. And now I'm complete. I'm whole, just like Adam was from the beginning. Amen. And guess what? I can't sin anymore. And I come back with Jesus here and I rule with Jesus in the glorified body. And I'm down here and I guess there's other people that aren't in glorified bodies that can sin, but I won't ever be able to sin. Amen. So that's what I'm waiting for is that day of redemption when my body is redeemed in the sense that my body now becomes a glorified body that can't sin anymore. Now I sit around and think about stuff like this. I don't know if you do, but... Uh, well, I'll get to that here in a second. Let's read Romans 8, and then I'll get to that. Because I just, I wonder what heaven will be like. And I just want to throw that out here, here in a second. But look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us when we get a glorified body that can't sin anymore. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. And it continues here, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. So my soul saved, but the body's not yet. So it's talking about when the body gets glorified. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. <laughs> All of creation is going, oh, sin is the problem. Someday there'll be no sin. But verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And then it says, for we are saved by hope. We know the Bible calls the rapture our blessed hope. Amen. So we are groaning within ourselves. Do you ever feel that? I get emails, I get phone calls from people that say, Oh, Brother Breaker, I'm so tired of this world. Oh, when's it going to be over? When is it going to be a time when there's no more sin? When do we get out of this corruption and this mess and this? And I'm like, hey, that's a Bible verse. <laughs> You're groaning within yourself waiting for the redemption of the... Aren't you? Well, you know exactly what Paul felt, don't you? You might be a same person. I mean, it sounds like it. If that's what you're doing is you're groaning within yourself going, oh, is it over yet? But you can't just sit around and wait for it to be over. We're supposed to be serving Jesus, trying to win people to the Lord and help them to get saved. Amen. So there's something to do. Don't just give up, right? There's something to do. And are you doing it? Now, when we get to heaven, there'll be no sin in heaven. And I'm excited about that. But here's what I'm thinking about from time to time, and I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess we'll just have to find out when we get there. But right here is the physical world that we live in now. Here's the spiritual world. In God's eyes, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of, of promise. So I'm, I'm this. I'm the new creature. I'm my soul with God's Spirit. And it's, it's together. It's, it's a, it's, it can't be separated. You know what I'm saying? But here I'm in this body of flesh. If my body died right now, my soul and spirit would go to heaven and I'd be in the spirit world. And I reckon I can do whatever I want to do in the spirit world. Whatever people do in the spirit, they do in the spirit world. So I guess up in heaven, my dad's up there. I go up there to see my dad and my dad goes, come on, son, let's go fishing in the, in the sea of glass. Okay. And I guess in your spirit body, you can fish for spiritual fish or something. I don't know. I, get, I don't know what exactly you can do in that world that you can't do in our world. It must be kind of like the same, but it's everything spiritual. But when the rapture comes, then I go back up to heaven. Now I've got a body too. What can I do with the body that's a physical body in the spiritual world? Do you see what I'm saying? What 
can you do different over there with this than without this? I sit around and think about stuff like that. I don't know. <laughs> so imagine going to heaven and everybody in heaven now, except for Enoch, doesn't have a glorified body. It's just their soul and their spirit. And I guess Enoch's the only one up there in, well, no, I guess uh, Elijah and Moses too, that have a, a physical body, right? So there's three fellas up there, that, the only ones with their physical body. <laughs> you think they stand out like a sore thumb? I mean, and what can they do that everybody else up there can't do? Or is it like you can't do anything with it, so it's no big deal? I don't know. I think about these things. You ever think about stuff like that? I'm just like, weird. Or what if you go up there, but you can't do anything because you don't have a body to do something with? So people up in heaven go, man, I can't wait to get the body because I'm, I'm bored up here. I can't do anything. I, is that how that works? I don't know. But what I do know is that this is the problem. And this is what's saved. And I'm waiting to get into that world to get free from what? From the presence of sin. Amen. So I am saved from the penalty of sin. That's my salvation. And whenever we talk about salvation, that's what we're talking about. My soul being saved. Amen. Can I sin as a Christian? I can, but should I? I shouldn't. So I need to do the best I can to live a Christian life. That's called sanctification. That's called living holy. Whatever sin I have in my life, I need to get that out to be a better testimony for Jesus. Now, I will be saved one day from the presence of sin when I get here, either when I die or when the rapture comes and I'm in heaven, I'm free from the presence. So do you see why I called it threefold salvation? I have been saved. I'm still in the process of being saved in the sense from, from sin in the body but I shall be saved in the sense that now I'll be whole when I get to the end past the rapture like Adam and Eve should have, or were at the beginning. So it only took 6,000 years of history for us to get back to what Adam and Eve lost, right? But when Adam and Eve were created, God put them in this world. So there's something about this world that is good. You know what I'm saying? But sin has destroyed this world. That's why in the Bible at the end, God destroys it and makes a new heaven and a new earth. Now, what can we do in this world that we can't do in the spirit world? I don't know. I have so many questions. I can't wait to find out what the spirit world is like and what you can. All I know is this. This is the way it's set up. And all I know is if you're not saved, you need to get saved because otherwise you'll be in this world in your soul that has not been forgiven and you'll be in a place where the Bible says you will feel literal flames and fire. Amen. And you will feel torment for all eternity for rejecting Jesus Christ. So you can choose eternal bliss or eternal damnation. And the choice is yours. So your soul getting saved is the most important thing. Amen. But just how weird there's two different worlds. This is the only one we know, even though we're in this one. Thank God our eyes are closed that we can't see into that world. Do you remember in the Bible when, I don't know if it was Elijah or something, he says, open their eyes so they may see. And all of a sudden his eyes were open to the spirit world. He saw all these angels everywhere. Are you glad we can't see in the spirit world? I am. Because who knows what's hiding out there. There might be 15 demons out there in the road. And all of a sudden we could open it. Ah! We'd be scared to death, wouldn't we? And look behind you, there's three angels. What the? Ah! I mean, I th they'd put you in an insane asylum probably. So it's kind of good that we can't go into that world right now. Or can we? There's a thing called drugs. And the drugs are pharmakia, and they could get you an entrance into seeing into that world. And that's kind of scary. Alcohol yes, alcohol for many years was called spirits. Why? Because they say in Spanish when you, when you drink it, veo pachingos. I see a bunch of cartoons. I see things that aren't there. Maybe they are there. Maybe that's getting you into the spirit world. Is it, you use that word too, pachingo? That's in Honduras. They hope pachingo is either. Okay, but drugs too can take you into a spirit world. So that's why we need to be very careful. And how sad that our border is open and more drugs are coming in and more and more people are getting into that. And I hear more and more stories of people saying, hey, I hear voices and I see things at night and things like that. The devil is building his kingdom and he's trying to get people to see him. And that's scary. But the Holy Spirit is all that matters. 
So that's it. That's my sermon. I hope it's a blessing. I just wanted you to see, like I said, this is one of the most basic teachings is we are saved from the penalty of sin. We're saved from the power of sin, but that's a daily part of the Christian walk. And one day we'll be saved from the presence of sin. Thank God Amen. when we get to heaven. Amen. And what a blessing it'll be because I don't want to sin. And when you're saved, you shouldn't want to sin either. The Holy Spirit in you gives you that desire to not want to do wrong. Yeah, he wants you have that desire to want to do right. Amen. Amen. So does anybody have any questions or, or comments? Yes, sir, Brother Rob, what's up? Um, where do animals fit into all of this? Because they're obviously more than just a body because they have emotions and they can interact with us. But I guess I'm assuming they don't have... You know, like well, animals, I would say, don't have souls okay. because Jesus died on the cross for us. Right. I don't think he died for a cocker spaniel. But animals to be are a body and a spirit. And I, it's in Ecclesiastes, if I remember correctly. It says the, something about an animal dies and its spirit goes to the earth. So I don't see a soul in an animal. I see a, an animal having a body and a spirit. And when it dies, well, that's the end of it because its body goes to the grave. And it, Now, some people, they love their pets so much that they don't like to hear that. So I say, well, maybe, just maybe... God, since he resurrects us, he'll resurrect your pet over here. And then that makes them all happy. Oh, maybe I'll have my pet again. I mean, God can do anything, right? So maybe he knows where that spirit is and maybe there's a, <laughs> a spirit heaven for dogs. I don't think dogs go up to heaven, but I don't know. Maybe there's some, maybe God will do that for us. I don't know. But I don't believe they're souls. Now, a lot of people say, no, animals have souls. Adam, I mean, uh, Noah went into the ark and all these animals went with them. And what does it say? How many were on the ark? Eight souls. <laughs> that was Noah, his wife, his three kids, and their three wives. So I don't see animals having souls because if they did, we would have to take this verse so literally, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that I'd have to go to your chicken coop and I'd have to go over to the pet store and start preaching the gospel to every single animal. And I guess I'd have to go out in the garden and look for every earthworm and say, hey, you need to get saved. I mean, that would be a little kind of overboard, I think, and would make us look pretty dumb. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I, I think about that a lot. People that lose their animals are really grieved. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about the animals in heaven, but I do know there's horses. Right. So if there's horses... Would he, I, I don't know how this would happen. God only knows. Right. So in the Bible, we talk, it talks about us coming back on horses. So we know there's at least spirit horses, but were they ever horses with bodies? So I don't know. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point. So there are spirit animals in heaven, but does that mean every animal that ever existed here, their spirit goes to heaven? That'd be a lot of animals in heaven. And that'd be a lot of poop everywhere. Because what do animals do? They poop. No, I don't know. Well, I guess it'd be glorified poop or something. I don't know. But, it, but I just, I, that's one of the things I don't know. But like you said, and you said it very well, a lot of people get very emotionally attached to their pets. And if God loves us, maybe he loves us that much that he will give them back to us in a millennium. And wouldn't that be a wonderful thought? But do they have a soul? I don't see them having a soul. Otherwise, like I said, we'd have to be going to preaching to every animal and who knows if they would even understand what we're what we're saying right so i don't i don't know that's just one of those things i have friends that said no animals have souls well i just don't see them getting saved so that means every dog you've ever owned is lost and on its way to hell <laughs> i mean see the mess you get into there so that's a subject we'll just pass on you know and say time to move to a next thing but i'm just saying um animals are fun but all I know is the Bible just says they're a spirit and a body. So does their spirit somehow live for all eternity? That'd be a lot of animals on the other side. And it'd be kind of strange. So I don't know. I don't know. Anybody else? Isn't our soul that goes right to heaven, isn't our soul the memories of? Well, some, okay, in the old ancient Greece, they used to say your soul is like inside here or something. But that's not what it says. If you go to Luke chapter 16, um, you have the rich man in hell and you have the other guy in Abraham's bosom. And it sounds like a soul, it's, it's, and I'm not a good artist, but it sounds like the soul is a spiritual shape of your body. 
So here, and this is very crude, here is a fleshly body. This is your flesh. Inside of that is your soul. And in the spirit world, you could see it and it looks just like you. And there have been people that have had their leg cut off. And they still say, well, I feel I have an itch down here on the end. So that flesh is missing, but that soul, that's still there. So the soul is a body, a spirit body, that's inside of your fleshly body that's the same shape. And if you could see you in the spirit world, you would recognize you. Because in Luke chapter 16, they look across that gulf and they recognized each other. Amen. So it must have a spiritual eyes. It must have a spiritual tongue because the guy in hell says, send Father Abraham that he may dip my tongue in water. Or water, Yeah, and drop of, of... And then inside that, though, is the spirit. And the spirit is just like this great emptiness that can be filled. And so it has to be filled with the spirit. And it's born dead when you're born. And it needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I see that the soul is not just this little thing up here. It's a body that in the spirit world people see. And so you would recognize. And hopefully, I don't know, it's not when we're old and ugly like we are right now. <laughs> it's how we looked when we were about 33. Because that's when you're your prime. That's when Jesus died. So I was a little bit handsome at 33, maybe. And so for all eternity, I might look a little more handsome than, than I do now, fat and ugly. But um, so if you're ugly, I bet God will give you a pretty soul. Let's put it that way, you know. But you'll be able to recognize each other's souls. And I believe that. I believe that's in the Bible. So does that make sense? So that idea, that Greek thing, the Greeks would say that, that it's just this little thing in here. But they didn't, they, they didn't know the Bible. So I don't think they had that right. But that's interesting. We were watching some documentary the other day or something about Leonardo da Vinci. And he thought that. And he would dissect people and pull their brains out and try to find their soul and things like that. Because he was reading the old books from Greeks. But the Bible's clear. That rich man and that other guy, they recognized each other. And so a soul has arms and legs. And it's just a spirit body inside our body that looks the same. Yes. You feel the spirit. You can feel through your entire body from your head to your toe. Yeah. And sometimes you feel the Holy Spirit Amen. and you feel it. And yeah, you can feel it through. It's, it's an interesting thing, but we don't want to go too much by our feelings because we can be misled. Right. Yeah. And we go by Amen. facts, not by feelings. We go by evidence, not by our emotions. Amen. But still, like when we're singing these hymns, well, I get a little tingle sometimes. I'm just like, "Woo! praise the Lord. That's a good hymn. Amen. So things like that. Any, yes. You mentioned that there's just a couple people in heaven with a glorified body, but didn't we learn a couple weeks ago that many of the saints arose? Oh, Jesus? yes. Very good. Very good. That's right. Whenever Jesus arose, those Old Testament saints arose, so they would have arisen with their glorified body. So yeah, there there would be more people in heaven with glorified bodies. So people that died during the church age, you get up there, and they don't have their glorified body yet, and they're meeting these other people. Is, is it, how different is, I mean, what can you do in a glorified body in the spirit world that you can't do if you're only in the spirit body and not a, a, a physical glorified? You see what I'm saying? Is, is there a difference? Does it matter? I don't know. I, don't, I honestly don't know. Um, maybe if they say it's cold in heaven, very, very cold. So maybe you got to wear a, a bigger robe because <laughs> your glorified body, you get up there, I'm cold all the time. You know, well, I'm in the spirit. It doesn't bother me. I don't have my body to feel it. You know, I don't know. I think about silly things like this, but at the same time, I think about it. It's like, because in heaven, are they up there groaning too? Like we're groaning? We're groaning, wanting our glorified body. Are they up in heaven going, man, if I just had my glorified body, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Don't get me wrong, but I sure miss my body. I mean, are the, are the saints from the church age up there singing, I ain't got nobody. I mean, and they're waiting for it. Is that how that works? I don't know. But I do know that we'll all have a glorified body someday. We'll all be just like Adam and Eve, we who are saved. But those who aren't saved, how sad, how sad. I think it's the limitations of the physical versus spirit because what, are you, what can you actually do in your physical body here before we tire? Up there it talks about we won't tire when we run or we'll have to be able to climb in the rocks like the hinds and stuff like that. And it's, I think it's a limitation that's upon us because of our sin and everything else. So we're limited so we can only do so much harm or damage to ourselves and the people around us. Why? 
we're in this world mm -hmm. first will we have the freedom and the power and ability to be able to be open up and do what we like in heaven because we are saved we know the mind of christ we know what he wants and we won't sin at that time because we'll be in our glorified bodies so we'll have a lot more ability and free reign to do what we like amen and another thing too that i think is quite interesting they say that we only use about 10 percent of our brain mm -hmm. so imagine having that unlocked and you're using, what if you're even using 40% of it? You'd be the smartest person ever. So imagine 100% and it's like you're tapped into the mind of God. It's like you finally get the Ethernet or whatever, the internet of heaven. You know everything because you know what Jesus knows. So I could just imagine sitting down for a million years and just thinking because there's so much stuff you never thought about. And it's all, I mean, you said um, there's no million of years. You're in eternity, but you're just sitting up there in eternity just Going like this, thinking, I never thought about that before. I never, oh, I never, I mean, you know what I mean? It's just going to be like mind blowing. It's just going to be incredible. So it'll be wonderful. Amen. And sin is the problem. Amen. And so only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. And that's what we need to remember. And uh, so, amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, I hope that's been a blessing to you. I hope you understand it. I try to make it simple. And that's, one of the most simplest sermons that's ever been preached. Sorry that I stole it. I try not to steal other people's sermons, but again, it's just the best way to say it. We're saved from the penalty of sin daily, from the power of sin, the future from the presence of sin. And yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Worm. Speaks of the worm. Is that your spirit? Okay, so Jesus said, "Where the worm dieth not." Now you look at um, in. The Bible, it says, you're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Well, what is the devil? He's like a snake. And so if you're like your father, you'll be like your father. So we're sons of God, we'll be like the father. If you're a son of Satan and he's an old snake, what will you end up being? Well, Dr. Ruckman, my old pastor, used to teach, and you know he doesn't run to the Greek or anything, but he did point out that in the Greek language, that word, worm, was red maggot. And so he said, what if... Because if you're lost, you go to hell and you're a child of the devil, that over time you just start turning into a giant like snake or a giant just your arms weld together you're, and you just you turn into just a, a maggot. And so now you're down there and you look down at hell, it's just a bunch of maggots like this all over each other. Like you go to the bait shop and buy a bunch of worms and they're all, you know. And because of that, and there's many reasons why he taught that, but one of them, Jesus says, you can lose your body and soul in hell. So do you lose that soul's bodily shape and it just turns into what the devil is? Just a big old worm or snake? And what a horrible thing to think of because if you're lost, you're burning in the torture of the flame, then you're feeling all these others around you suffering and screaming and having the whole thing. And you're just a pile of maggots burning for all eternity. I don't delight in saying that. I, to me, that's horrible. And that's why I don't want anybody to go to hell because that just sounds awful. But that's what he taught, and it wasn't because he ran to the Greek to teach it. It's because these other verses talk about uh, you lose your bodily shape and lose your body. And so, and so it, it could be, it could very well be. What a horrible thing because you end up like your father. So if you choose the devil as your father, he's a serpent, he's a snake, he's a worm-like thing. And so, wow, what a creepy, creepy creepy thing to think about. In Norse mythology, they refer to the dragon and the snake as the worm. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Look what New Year, the Chinese New Year's is this year, the year of the dragon. Year of the dragon. So it's not a far stretch to, to look at a snake and a worm and, you know, they're kind of the same. But um, thank God we're saved. If you're not, don't leave here without getting saved. Amen. But it's good to be saved and know that we have these promises. And um, what we need to encourage each other as Christians is to get away from sin. Amen. And that's the hard part. And if we need to help each other, let's help each other. Hey, I'm struggling with this, brother. Don't tell anybody. And, you know, oh, okay. And maybe we can help each other. Right. If you're married, it's good to have a wife or a husband to help you with that too. Um, but uh, don't get into sin because it's the worst. <laughs> and you really can get into a mess when you try to cover up your sins too. And so the least sin you have, the better things are. Amen. And the Holy Spirit's in there to help you. So yield to the Spirit, not to the flesh. Amen. Okay? Anybody else? And you know, it starts in the mind. It starts here. 
So you need to get this clean. Where shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed therefore unto his word. That's why we need to memorize scripture. We need to go to the book and read it and have verses. When the devil came to Jesus in the 40 days uh, fasting, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. Jesus quoted scripture back. So the more Bible you know, the easier it'll be. Amen? Amen. Okay. Anybody else? <sighs> well, amen. All right. Now, guess what? I'm going to go home and do this in Spanish today, too, because uh, I've been making this the, the sermon of the week in order to get me to that meeting and everything else. So thank you for being here. Uh, again, I won't be here next week, so Brother Ray will be here, and you'll be talking about the... It's, it's Paul's gospel presentation. So, so he presented the gospel in, in Romans uh, chapter 1 through chapter 3. Awesome. So basically, you're going back in time to about 60 A.D. and you get to listen to if Paul was here and he'd tell you how to get saved, right? And you're going to do it all in Greek, just like Paul would have, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Agatha <laughs> Samara. No. But anyway, um, so, man, I wish I could be here. I hope you record it so we can listen. And uh, again, a lot of people go to Romans 10 before they go to Romans 3. And Romans 3 was written first. So don't just pick and choose from the Bible. Go to the part... That's, that's the part that's most important, the blood, the message of the blood. So, all right, Brother Matt, would you mind closing us in prayer today? Absolutely. All right, appreciate it. Dear Lord, God, thank you for this day and our blessings. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together, read, believe, hear your word. Thank you for blessing us. And I ask that as everyone here goes about the coming days and, and the next week to come, that you watch over everyone here, give everyone encouragement, strength, and uh, overall, uh, any opportunity that they get to preach on you and speak about you to somebody else uh, in order to help get souls to save and come to you. We thank you for saving us from eternity and hell by your shed blood and delivering us so we can glorify you until we get to see you face to face. And I ask that you watch everyone over everyone here as they go about their ways in safety and uh, give us strength to glorify you in everything that we do. And all praise and glory be unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.